So I'm really glad to, to be here uh, presenting the, the new results of Quora. And uh, together with the Quora and the Qubit collaborations, we also decided to uh, change the title of the presentation. And uh, so we'll also uh, briefly talk about the uh, prospects for the future of Quora, namely Qubit. So we already had a nice introduction to double beta decay by Kai earlier on this morning. So I will completely skip the theory. And, uh, but since there are a couple of other, a uh, few other talks uh, on other uh, bolometric uh, experiments for double beta decay, I will give a short introduction on, uh, on the bolometric technique. So first of all, uh, I don't really like the word bolometer because it refers to something else. What we are actually talking about here is cryogenic calorimeters. And what they are is depicted uh, in here. So basically the idea is to uh, take uh, an absorbing crystal and to measure the phonons or the heat induced by uh, ionizing radiation. Uh, so if you want to measure the, the heat release, for example, by a 1 MV particle, uh, the, the temperature difference that you expect is of the order of uh, uh, 10 microkelvin. So to see such a tiny signal, uh, you need to get rid of the thermal noise and to operate your detector at about uh, 10 millikelvin. Uh, so the, the idea is to take a bunch of crystals and that are uh, at the same time source for double beta decay and detectors and to operate them in a, in, in a dilution uh, refrigerator. And the signals that you would get uh, look like this. So the, uh, the delta T, so the, the, the signal amplitude uh, in temperature uh, is uh, equal to the deposited energy uh, over the, the heat capacity of the crystal. And then the decay time of the signal uh, is equal to the conductivity of the coupling between the crystal and the thermal bath and the heat capacity itself. So in practice, you have a crystal which is sitting on some uh, holder, and the holder makes the thermal coupling. So then you can play with the shape and the material of the holder and the size or the type of crystal uh, to tune uh, C and G, and basically tune the, the, the amplitude response and the shape of the, of the pulse. Now, if you look at the scale here, these are seconds, and it's not a typo. Uh, so these detectors are very slow, and this gives some advantage and some disadvantage. So the advantage is that uh, you can safely forget about hardware trigger. You can just digitize everything and then do some uh, digital trigger afterwards. And if you want, you can uh, invent new trigger algorithms and uh, further optimize uh, and lower the, the trigger threshold. But at the same time, these, uh, these signals are very slow, so you are very, uh, like you have this constraint that uh, uh, you cannot afford high counting rates uh, simply because a uh, signal is like several seconds long. Uh, then the next uh, ingredient uh, is uh, the discrimination between different types of particles. So as we know, there are several crystals that uh, also emit scintillation light. So. Uh, what if I use a scintillating crystal for double beta decay? Uh, it turns out that for most scintillating crystal, the light yield depends on the part, type of particle that releases the, the energy. So for example, uh, for lithium molybdate or cadmium tungstate crystal, uh, beta and gamma particles will have a higher light yield than alpha particles, while for example, for uh, zinc selenite, you have the opposite. So what we do is uh, we to, to couple the main crystal uh, to a light detector. The light detector itself uh, is a cryogenic calorimeter. And typically, it is a germanium or silicon wafer, also instrumented uh, with a thermistor. And then uh, you read the, the phonons or the heat in the main crystal, and you, hit, and you read the scintillation light uh, uh, from the secondary detector that we usually call just light detector. Uh, so typically, 
Uh, the, the, the thermometers that are normally used are uh, either neutron transmutation doped uh, uh, thermistors. Uh, so this is what is used, for example, in, uh, in Quare, Cupid Zero, and uh, Cupid Mo. Or you can have fancier uh, and faster uh, readout, for example, with transition and sensors, or uh, kinetic indu inductance detectors, or MMCs, which are, for example, uh, I think the ones used by, by Amore. Um, then uh, another thing that is valid in general for uh, bolometric uh, detectors uh, is that uh, the, the, de the detector technology is decoupled uh, from the isotope that does double beta decay. Uh, on the other hand, if you take, for example, uh, uh, I don't know, Gerda or Legend, uh, they use germanium detectors. They study double beta decay in germanium, and they can only do that. Uh, with bolometers, you completely decouple the infrastructure, so the, the, the cryogenic uh, infrastructure, from the, the isotope that you want to study. So in principle, you can use uh, the same uh, dilution refrigerator and make multiple runs with different crystals. Uh, so this gives a lot of choice uh, for which type of crystal and which isotope to use. Oh, sorry. What did, okay. And uh, the, uh, the, the way to choose an isotope uh, can be uh, summarized in this plot. So on the x-axis, we have the isotopic abundance. And on the y-axis, we have the Q-value. So from, on the one hand, you want to use uh, uh, an isotope that has a high natural abundance so that it's uh, typically easier and cheaper to enrich. On the other hand, you want to have an isotope which has a high Q value. And especially, there are these two uh, dash lines that represent the typical endpoint for the environmental gamma radioactivity. So this is the, the thallium line at 2.6 MeV and the endpoint for the beta radioactivity, uh, which is at 3.28 uh, MeV. Um, so the, in the case of Quare, we chose uh, tellurium-130, which is below both lines, but is very close to the, to the thallium line. So it's right below it. Uh, that, and in that region, the, you have a component uh, from gamma radiation, but it's low enough because you are basically in between the Compton shoulder and the gamma itself. Uh, and on the other hand, the isotopic abundance of the Lure 130 is the highest, so it's about uh, 34%. Uh, so for Quare, we didn't even reach uh, the material, and we just used uh, uh, material with natural abundance. So Quare is an international collaboration. Um, with uh, about 20 institutions coming mostly from uh, the US and Italy. And then we also have some uh, French and uh, Chinese institution. And here you, sorry, here you see a picture of the, of the crystals. Uh, this is uh, the same picture from another uh, angle. So we have 988 tellurium dioxide crystals, uh, as I said, with natural tellurium composition. The total mass, uh, the total crystal mass is uh, 742 kilograms, and uh, which corresponds to 206 kilograms of uh, active isotopes, so of tellurium 130. And uh, as I said, the Q value is uh, um, 2,527 keV. Uh, the experiment is uh, located in, uh, in Gran Sasso National Lab. And for those uh, who have never been there, they can just open my slides, click on the link, and you will go on uh, uh, Google Street View, and, have a, and you can have a look of how the, the lab looks inside. Um, nominally, um, Quare wanted to achieve uh, a background goal of uh, 10 to the minus 2 counts per kV kilogram year in the region of interest. Uh, and with five years of lifetime, uh, the, the nominal sensi exclusion sensitivity is uh, almost 10 to the 26 years. Um, the, the infrastructure of Quare is uh, itself a huge argument that could cover an entire talk, but I try to summarize everything in just one slice, a slide. So we have uh, uh, what is still now the biggest dilution refrigerator in the world. 
Uh, it's a multi-stage cryostat. It has six different stages. And the main, uh, the, the cooling systems are uh, a fast cooling system uh, that uh, brings down uh, the, the, the temperature of the entire thing to about 10 Kelvin. Then we have pulse tubes and a dilution unit. So in, just to give you an idea of uh, the power that we need to cool down, uh, you need to take into account that we have about 15 tons of material that are at uh, 4 Kelvin or lower and three tons that are below 50 millikelvin. Um, these type of detectors are also very sensitive uh, to noise, and the noise in this case uh, uh, is uh, vibrational. So we are very sensitive, for example, to earthquakes or to the trucks passing by the, the highway next to the lab and stuff like that. Uh, and we are also very sensitive to the noise induced by the, the cooling equipment itself. Uh, so in the last couple of years, we invented some technique to, to do active noise cancelling. Uh, and then what you see here on the right is a mock-up of the core structure. So uh, these red things are just the, the structure that sustain the cryostat. The cryostat is the one here in the middle, and then we have some uh, passive shielding around. And in particular, we have uh, lead, polyethylene, and uh, HBO panels to absorb neutrons. And uh, yeah, so we uh, installed the detectors in Quora in uh, summer 2016. Then uh, over in, the, in autumn 2016, we uh, finished assembling all the, the cables uh, and everything, and we started to cool down around uh, Christmas 2016. And then in January 2017, we saw the first, part, the first events. And then for the first two years, our uh, lifetime was not so good, or our duty cycle was not so good, because when you have such a complicated machine, it takes uh, uh, a lot of effort to actually optimize just the, uh, the way you operate it. So as you can see here, over those two years, uh, we only 17% only of the time was dedicated to, uh, to data taking, so to physics data. Then we have about 11% of the time that was calibrations. And uh, uh, the downtime, which is the, the white, uh, the missing part here was uh, 33, 34%. And 32% uh, of the time was dedicated to, to test runs, so to really the optimization of the, of the setup. Um, Right now, the situation is much more improved. So the downtime uh, is very small. It's like a few percent. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the amount of time that we dedicate to physics data is uh, around 70%. So the main things that we did was to uh, minimize the noise. So we installed some linear drives uh, to reduce the, the noise induced uh, by the pulse tubes. And we implemented some uh, active noise cancelling. So as you can see here, so what you have in, uh, in blue or violet, I don't know, uh, is the noise that we had originally. Then in red, we have the, the noise power spectrum after installing the linear drives. And in green, we have uh, uh, the, the noise after with the linear drives and also uh, implementing the tuning of the phases of different pulse tubes. So we have five pulse tubes that run at the same time, and you can tune the phases uh, of them with respect to each other to minimize the noise, so that basically uh, each of them uh, uh, subtracts the noise induced by the other. And then we, we also improved the, all the procedures for the determination of the load curves or the, the temperature scans. And uh, uh, we improved a lot of things also from the analysis point of view. And in particular, we developed this uh, optimum trigger. So originally, our trigger uh, was just a derivative trigger. So you basically take the, the, the rise of the signal and uh, set a threshold and uh, define an event uh, when, the, um, when your uh, amplitude goes above the threshold. Uh, the optimum trigger does something different, so it takes into account the noise spectrum and uh, the, the signal shape, and uh, it, 
it basically uh, defines an event based on the full uh, five seconds of signal. And the result is that you can lower the threshold from, let's say, 40 keV to less than 10 keV. Uh, so this is a major improvement that will allow us also to do low energy searches. Um, the data stream is, uh, and the data processing is summarized in the next couple of slides. So once I have uh, uh, my, my continuous data and the, the trigger times obtained with the optimum trigger, uh, we filter them with the optimum filter to evaluate the amplitude. Again, the optimum filter is tuned on the, both on the ideal shape of the signal and on the noise uh, power spectrum. Uh, and then we need to correct for gain. This is because the, the, the response of the crystal and of the readout, so the NTD, uh, depend on temperature. So we, we need to apply a gain correction. After that, we can uh, do the energy calibration. And, uh, and then we uh, uh, identify the coincidences. So for example, here in this picture, we have two type of events. So you have a signal-like event, which releases energy only in one crystal. This is because uh, uh, a double beta decay event will, re will uh, release two electrons in one spot. These two electrons are absorbed within a few millimeter cubes. So you expect them to release energy only in one crystal. Our crystals are cubes of five centimeter by side. Uh, on the other hand, you can have uh, uh, a gamma that makes a Compton scattering in one channel in one crystal and then releases the rest of energy in another crystal. So this is a background event for us. Um, at that point, uh, uh, we still have to do some other things. So we need to get rid of the um, events that are not physical, that have a shape completely different than what we would expect. And then we do blinding. So actually, we don't do blinding, but we do salting. So we take a random fraction of, the, of events from the thallium line, and we move it to Q beta beta, and vice versa. So when people do the high level analysis, they have no idea what is around here. So we first, uh, the idea is of that of uh, defining all the, the analysis procedure and all the cuts. And only once everything is, uh, all the procedure is frozen, we unsalt uh, and look uh, what's underneath this fake peak. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so this is uh, in short uh, the, the entire analysis procedure. And then of course, uh, uh, there are some other important ingredients that are uh, uh, understanding uh, what, uh, how an eventual uh, neutrinoless double beta decay uh, peak would look like. So we do this uh, using calibration data. So we take uh, the, the thallium line from calibration data. We developed uh, uh, an effective uh, uh, model to parameterize it. And then, so in this case, we have uh, three Gaussians to describe the main peak, and then we have some other Gaussians for the X-ray escapes. Here we have a uh, shoulder for the multi-Compton events. So we take the main component, and uh, we project it into the background data. So for example, this is the potassium-40 peak uh, in the background or physics data. And here we estimate, uh, from here we estimate the, the difference uh, with respect to the nominal value from literature and the energy resolution in the physics data. And then we, we do this for all the peaks we have in the, in the physics data and we extract uh, uh, an estimation for the, the bias and the energy resolution. Then of course we need to evaluate all the efficiencies. So we have several terms. One is the containment efficiency, uh, which is uh, how many events uh, uh, you, uh, how many neutrinoless double beta decay events uh, you expect to release energy only in one crystal. And this is done with Monte Carlo simulations. Then we have the reconstruction efficiency, which basically covers all these steps until here. Uh, and this is 95.8%. Uh, um, 
five minutes, okay. Then we have the anti-coincidence efficiency, which is the probability of uh, uh, correctly identifying uh, a single crystal event, and we do this using the, the potassium line at uh, 1460 keV. And finally, we have the efficiency of pulse shape analysis that turns out to be 92%. So the, the, the physics spectrum looks like this. So we have, uh, um, on the top part, we have mostly alpha peaks. So, so these are the closed contaminations, so contaminations of the crystals or of the crystal structures. So all the material that is next to the crystals. Then we have at low energy, a big component from the two neutrino spectrum and a bunch of gamma lines coming mostly from uh, uh, the cryosat parts or the shielding itself. Um, we do, uh, so if we zoom in uh, in the region of interest, we have something like that. And we parameterize this uh, with three components. So we have here the, the Q value. So here is where we look for the neutrino double beta decay peak. And then we have a, a, a line, which is a summation from the two gammas from cobalt-60, uh, and a flat background coming mostly from degraded alphas. So we parameterize this with, uh, with an extended likelihood. And uh, we do a fully Bayesian fit, and we obtain a background index of 1 point, uh, let's say 1.4 times 10 to the minus two counts per keV kilogram year, so slightly worse than what we than the design value. And we have, uh, with this background, we have an exclusion sensitivity, uh, with this background and the current exposure, we have an exclusion sensitivity of 1.7 times 10 to the five years. And uh, when we run the fit on the actual data, we see no evidence for neutrino less double beta decay, and we place a limit of uh, 3.2 times 10 to the 25 years on the half-life of uh, tellurium-130 which corresponds to uh, a limit of 75 to 350 milli electron volt on the effective Majorana mass under the assumption of light neutrino exchange. And uh, uh, we prepared a publication which is on the archive since uh, a couple of months and that uh, hopefully will come out in PRL soon. So now what we learned for Quora is that uh, our background is mostly alpha. So here we have uh, the quarry data, this is not full, the full statistic, but just a fraction of it. The quarry data around the region of interest. And then uh, uh, we have the simulation of the gamma component in red and the muons in black. So if you manage, uh, if, you, if we would use a different crystal that uh, would allow us to distinguish between alphas and beta gammas, we would already kill this part. If we would install uh, a muon veto, we could also remove the, the blue component. And if we would use another isotope with a higher Q value, we would be above the, the thallium line and also lower the, the gamma background. Uh, so right now we are uh, in the process of forming a new collaboration, uh, which is the merging of several other collaborations. So we have Quora, we have Cupid Zero. There will be a talk this afternoon. We have Cupid Mo and Cross. Uh, and also for them, there will be a talk in the parallel sessions. Um, so putting together the information from all these other experiments, uh, we made uh, uh, a background budget for Cupid. Uh, so we, we know that, uh, so from Cupid zero and actually also Cupid, mostly Cupid more, we have the, the contamination values for the crystals. Uh, from Quora, we have uh, the, we know the, the, the expected background from the cryostat uh, and, the, uh, and the shielding and the entire infrastructure. Uh, and, uh, and then we have also, uh, again, from Cupid Zero uh, and Quora, uh, we also have all the values uh, for, um, uh, for all parts, uh, uh, the closed parts uh, from the frames uh, uh, that sustain the crystals and so on. Uh, and if we look at this plot, this is what we expect. Uh, so we have uh, uh, the shielding that gives a 10 to minus five uh, contribution. The holders give some, something times 10 to minus five. And then we have three other components that uh, uh, give uh, a 10 to minus four contribution each. So our goal is to use uh, 
lithium molybdate crystal, so to switch from tellurium dioxide to lithium molybdate, to have about 1,500 crystals for a total mass of 250 kilograms. We want to reach uh, an energy solution of 5 keV. Obviously, we want to implement the alpha rejection via particle identification. And our background goal is 10 to minus 4 times 10 to the uh, counts per keV kilogram years. Uh, there is one thing that I skipped here, which is the two new uh, contribution. So molybdenum 100 has the shortest uh, half-life for the two neutrino double beta decay. The bolometers are very slow. So with this uh, half-life, even if it is way longer than the age of universe, uh, we still have a non-negligible contribution from the pile-up of two neutrino events. Uh, so we are now working on uh, reducing this contribution here by more advanced uh, algorithm for pile-up identification. And uh, uh, so this brings me to the last slide. So here we have uh, um, the discovery sensitivity for uh, most experiments in the field. Uh, the numbers that I gave you here refer to, this, uh, to the first uh, column. And uh, these are numbers that uh, uh, are very conservative. So this is what we would manage to get uh, if we would have the funding to start building now, the experiment now with the knowledge that we have now. Uh, with some reasonable assumption, for example, on improving the performance of the light detectors, uh, we believe that we could uh, reach uh, a background of 2 times to minus 5 counts per kV kilogram year, so with a further reduction of a factor of 5. And, uh, and then we also made uh, the exercise of uh, dreaming and saying what can we possibly do in a later stage uh, with a bigger cryostat uh, uh, with more knowledge on how to suppress the background and so on uh, in, a, in some undefined future. Uh, I want to just remark two things. Uh, as you can see, so this is the sensitivity in, uh, in the effective Majoranamas. Uh, the points, so the, the, the um, the boxes uh, for molybdenum that are these three are much uh, smaller than the, the, the ones for the other isotopes. This is just because uh, we still don't have uh, uh, a value for the nuclear matrix elements computing with the shell model. And the other thing which is more general is that this is just one example of one possible mechanism. Uh, so we need to take this plot with a grain of salt because there are many other possible mechanisms uh, that can contribute to double beta decay. And uh, this is all.